Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's Educate Next CEU lecture series. I'm your moderator, Morgan Turpin. I am part of the clinical laboratory here at Ambry Genetics. And today's topic is translational therapies for epilepsy. I'm honored to introduce today's speaker. I have a personal connection. I have a son with Dravet syndrome, and in 2016, we had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Davinsky as one of the top neurologists in the entire country. So um, he is the professor and director of the Epilepsy Center at the NYU School of Medicine, and he's also the director of St. Barnabas Institute of Neurology. Before we get started, we're going to go over some general housekeeping items. So just some reminders. Some of our automatic emails may arrive to your junk email folder. So if you add us to known senders, that will prevent that from happening. For CEUs, only the live session qualifies for CEUs. Attendance through GoToWebinar link and the evaluation at the end of the webinar are both required. For certificates, certified GCs looking for NSGC CEUs are awarded on a quarterly basis, and we're working on the application for the first quarter right now. It's better to register with your personal email to make sure that you receive these certificates in the event of a job change. Licensed CLSs looking for PACE certificates uh, are awarded one certificate per session, and they're available about four weeks after the session. And you must keep track of your own participation to verify that the CEUs earned are correct. If you have questions, you can email us at educatenext at ambrygen.com. Just some logistics. You are automatically muted when you join the webinar. This session is being recorded, and the recording will be available on the website. The control panel, panel excuse me, appears on the right side of your screen. And from the grab tab in the blue box, you can hide the control panel. You can view the webinar in full screen. And you can enter questions on the questions pane in the yellow box. You can ask questions at any time, but all questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar. The evaluation pops up in a web browser after the presentation when you close the webinar, and it also comes by email about an hour after the presentation, and you only need to complete one of these. It will not ask for your name as you're already logged in with the name that you used during the registration process. Please complete the, complete the evaluation soon after the webinar so you are included on the attendees report when we download it in the next couple of days. We will not be able to add you afterwards. Now I'm going to introduce today's speaker. Oren Davinsky is Professor of Neurology, Neurosurgery, and Psychiatry at the NYU School of Medicine, where he directs the Epilepsy Center. He also directs the St. Barnabas Institute of Neurology. His epilepsy research includes cannabidiol, autism, genetic epilepsies, sudden death in epilepsy, also known as SUDEP, healthful behavioral changes, therapeutic electrical stimulation, quality of life, cognitive and behavioral issues, and surgical therapy. He is the principal investigator for the North American SUDEP Registry and for the SUDC Registry and Research Collaborative. He is on the executive committee of the SUDEP Institute and scientific advisory boards of the Epilepsy Foundation, Duke 15Q Alliance, Tuber Sclerosis Association, KCNQ2 Cure Alliance Foundation, and chairs the Lulu Foundation CDKL5 Program of Excellence. He serves as the lead investigator for the Epidiolex, Dravet, and Lennox Gusto studies and the PTC Adelurin study in genetic epilepsy. He founded Finding a Cure for Epilepsy and Seizures, FACES, and co-founded the Epilepsy Therapy Project and Epilepsy.com. Outside interests include behavioral neurology, evolutionary biology, and history of neuroscience. So now I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Davinsky to begin the talk. Thank you very much, Morgan, and thank you to your colleagues at Ambry for inviting me to give this. It's my pleasure. The topic today is looking at how genetic information in children and adults with epilepsy can translate into how we care for those individuals. So to begin with, 
I just want to go over my disclosures, which is one, I'm trying to advance the slides if someone can help me. Morgan, can you advance if I say advance because my advance is not working now? Okay, so my one disclosure is that Paranomics, which is a company I will mention, um, is something that I do have a financial interest in. So to begin with, I think as many people on this webinar know, genetics has really revolutionized both what we know about epilepsy and how we think about epilepsy. So beginning in the mid-1990s, we first isolated some individual genes that were associated with epilepsy. And then from about 2000 to 2009 was a relatively quiet period where only a few new epilepsy genes were identified. And then beginning in 2008 to 9, with the introduction of next generation sequencing, which essentially allowed much higher throughput sequencing of genetic information and sequencing of the whole exome at reasonably uh, not too expensive prices for both clinical laboratories and researchers, a variety of other genes have been identified that are clearly associated with epilepsy and now have provided great impact on the practice of epilepsy. And these genes have mainly been identified in children with difficult to control epilepsy, but that window of patients who are evaluating, as I will get to, has expanded considerably and we're now evaluating other children with less difficult to control epilepsy and many of the adults, especially those who started out with children as epilepsy, uh, many who live in developmental centers and may no longer even be actively cared for by their parents, are also individuals in whom genetic diagnoses are often quite helpful and informative. So one of the first questions many physicians and parents and patients will ask is, why does it matter? Why do we want to make a genetic diagnosis? And George Mallory, who was one of the individuals who climbed Mount Everest, which is shown here in the background, uh, was asked the question, why would you ever want to climb that mountain? And his answer was, because it was there. Um, and the answer for making a genetic diagnosis at the first level is to really understand biology. I think the more we understand, the more powerful position we are in to help care for our patients. And there may be many genes that I will not touch on today that we know are epilepsy genes like CHD2, which causes Jevons photosensitive epilepsy, for which there are no specific therapies identified really based on the gene today, but there could be therapies in one year, two year, or four years. So even when there aren't therapies that impact treatment immediately, although other aspects can be impacted by the diagnosis, such as linking families together. And there may be things like special glasses that some children wear with this syndrome that may help prevent seizures that parents can share among each other. So even in cases where there's no specific drug therapy or specific diagnostic test, we can at a minimum link parents together, link parents with investigators who are pushing the envelope in these areas, uh, and so I would argue there's almost no case where more information is not helpful. But there are cases, and I'll go into these in more detail in this presentation, where making a genetic diagnosis, such as a mutation in the SCN1A or TSC1 or 2 genes, uh, will make really dramatic changes in the care where those diagnoses of those genetic disorders will impact what tests we may need to get will impact what drugs we choose to give for different epilepsies or non-epilepsy disorders, um, and also impact tremendously on prognosis uh, 
and availability and entry into clinical trials. So I would argue that knowing those diagnoses is usually impactful on a patient's diagnostic and therapeutic care, but also on preventive care. Both of these disorders, especially SCN1A mutations, are associated with high risk of sudden death or death due to status epilepticus. And those are pieces of information we can counsel families about and try to employ preventive strategies, which can hopefully be life-saving. In many times, we can clarify the prognosis, knowing if a specific genetic disorder is present. Uh, many of the ones we'll be talking about today tend to be long-term disorders, but even in those cases, although it may not be good news, number one, it's an answer, and number two, it allows families to plan and understand what the future is likely to bring. In many cases, it can identify how likely more seizures are to occur, or if there are other complications associated with the disorder. And very, very importantly, if there is a child or adult who has reproductive capabilities and can potentially um, have the intellectual and behavioral competencies to be a parent, then pre-implantation diagnosis and genetic testing can allow them to have a child who is not affected by the same genetic disorder, which is obviously usually impactful for many people. Sorry. So who should be tested for genetic epilepsy? And why don't we just simply test everybody, like some of my colleagues and friends David Goldstein would argue we should? Well, one reason we can't test everyone is it's just simply not realistic um, outside of research settings. Uh, epilepsy panels themselves are moderately expensive. Uh, and in select populations, or in broad populations, I should say, like adults with generalized epilepsy and adults with focal epilepsy who have well-controlled or just occasional breakthrough seizures, the chance of identifying a specific genetic cause in 2018 is quite small. So the reality is that for these types of cases, uh, I think research is critical and that is going on, uh, but to order tests clinically that have a extremely small yield and moderate to high cost is something that insurance companies are, of course, limiting. As I said, pediatric testing has been the classic model for epilepsy genetics. And this varies widely among clinicians who order the tests, uh, who may be geneticists, pediatric neurologists, pediatric epileptologists, uh, and certainly the type of testing that's ordered in an epilepsy panel is one thing. Whole exome sequencing often entails much more information and much more complexity in both interpreting the results and reporting them back to the patient and or the family. And many cases, a genetic counselor is often critical to be involved or a geneticist. And testing in adults is an evolving, but I would argue, very underutilized area. As with children, I think adult testing should be targeted for patients who have disorders that fit well-characterized genetic models. For example, nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy, which seems to be inherited as an autosomal dominant, can be a genetic disorder and can be identified on an epilepsy panel. So there are some adult epilepsies in which there clearly can be a high yield of a genetic test, whereas in others that don't fit any of the specific syndromes, the chance of identifying a pathogenic gene as the cause of that adult's epilepsy is quite small. The exception here are people who had early childhood onset epilepsies, uh, often infantile spasms, Lennox-Gastaut syndrome, symptomatic generalized epilepsies, and then over time eventually went to a developmental disability center, uh, went to live in a group home, and now may be seen once every six months, once a year, sometimes cared for by the local doctor who just refills prescriptions, but the neurologist or doctor who cares for that person may consider a genetic test because some of these people will be found to have SCN1A mutations, will be found to have tuberous sclerosis, uh, 
uh, but not have some of the classic skin manifestations that make the diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis complex more easy. So I think in many of the adults with childhood onset epilepsy and intellectual disability, genetic testing uh, can have a much higher yield than the adult population in general. So to get into the meat of what I'll be talking about, you know, here are a number of genes on the next several slides that I'll be reviewing in which a specific disorder and specific genes are known to be associated with specific therapies. So for example, patients with clinical GLUT1 deficiency, which is due to a mutation in the SLC2A1 gene, do remarkably well on the ketogenic diet, often as the only therapy for that disorder. Children with SCN2A, SCN8A, and KCNQ2 often respond well to sodium channel blockers. Now, interestingly, those sodium channel blockers are drugs which will actually make SCN1A disorders, Dravé syndrome disorders, worse because, and I'll get to this in a slide later on, many of these disorders, SCN2A and 8A, are due to essentially a gain of function. It's not that the sodium channels are defective and therefore they don't let sodium into the nerve cells. The problem is that they let too much sodium into the nerve cells. So these are disorders where dampening down those sodium channels will reduce that excess sodium inflow into nerve cells and thereby help to ameliorate and correct the problem. By contrast, in SCN1A or Dravé syndrome, you have a defective sodium channel and it's not letting enough sodium into neurons. It seems to be especially inhibitory gabinergic interneurons and the lack of sodium channel function is what causes the epilepsy and associated intellectual disabilities and motor disabilities in those children and adults. So for Dravé syndrome due to SCN1A mutations, those same <clears throat> sodium channel blockers will actually make their epilepsy and other aspects of their overall disorder much worse in some cases. So again, examples where knowing the specific genetic diagnosis will dramatically impact which medicines we use, and which medicines we choose not to use. For patients with ALDH7A1, which is a pyridoxine-dependent epilepsy, giving pyridoxine, vitamin B6, uh, can essentially fully ameliorate the seizures, whereas standard anti-epileptic drugs are not terribly helpful. There's a related disorder in another gene, the PNPO gene, uh, which codes for pyridoxal 5 prime phosphate synthesis, and in that epilepsy, providing supplementation with pyridoxal 5 prime phosphate can, again, dramatically improve the patient's overall condition and seizure control. One of the great early examples of a genetic epilepsy for which we now really understand the molecular biology and cellular uh, metabolic biology fairly well are tuberous sclerosis complex due to either TSC1, which is the less common mutation, or TSC2, which is both more common and unfortunately, in general, more severe as far as its effects on the body. And just as to refresh everyone, tuberous sclerosis complex is due to mutations in one of these genes or probably the regulatory elements around these genes in the small number of cases where such mutations in these genes or their splice sequences are not found. And it essentially, the, these genes together, the proteins that they make, come together and serve as a break to slow down the effects on the, M, on the mTOR pathway. So it's a bit like this pathway, which is one that helps regulate the growth of cells. When cells are functioning normally and there's plenty of glucose and there's plenty of oxygen and everything is healthy, the signal down the mTOR pathway will tell the cell to grow. And there's a normal homeostatic 
feedback mechanism within cells to grow so much, but not too much. Well, in TSC1 and TSC2 mutations, those proteins, hamartin or tuberin, one of them is not working, and the break does not work on the mTOR pathway, and there's too much mTOR activity resulting in too much cell growth and generally benign tumors. The manifestations of TSC can be on the brain, where there can be benign tumors, although some of them can grow and be life-threatening, called subependymal giant cell astrocytomas. Other manifestations in the brain are tubers, which are benign, disorganized groups of cells, many with giant nuclei, often with calcifications occurring over time. And those are often areas where seizures will begin, either within tubers or adjacent to tubers. And then other parts of the body are affected as well. The skin can have several manifestations from facial angiofibromas to hypopigmented macules to fibromas. The eyes can be affected, typically with benign hamartomas. Uh, the kidneys are probably the next most important organ after the brain, where angiomyolipomas, cysts, and occasional uh, renal carcinomas can occur. And especially in women, it is believed that those renal angiomyolipomas may spread to the lungs to cause lymphangiomyelomatosis, or LAM, which has the potential to be a deadly disorder over time. One of the great breakthroughs in tuberous sclerosis complex treatment has been the identification of several drugs that break this mTOR pathway and thereby help restore the normal function that was lost to the mutations. And these drugs include everolimus and sirolimus, and they are quite effective in shrinking segas in the brain, in shrinking or maintaining the size of angiomyolipomas. There's evidence they may be helpful in the LAM disease in the lung, and several recent trials have shown that they, these drugs, well, everolimus is the one that's been studied most extensively, is also effective at reducing seizures in children and adults with tuberous sclerosis. So here's a, a beautiful example where we understood the molecular and cellular biology of the disorder. We identified drugs that helped restore normal function, and indeed, these drugs have been helpful in treating multiple aspects of the disorder from tumor growth to seizure activity, and there are studies ongoing to see if it can help in treating cognitive and behavioral problems in children with tuberous sclerosis and comorbid autism. Now, a side story to the TSC disorder is something that's been pioneered in part by Peter Crino and his associates, and that is the concept of a group of mTORopathies. So there are drugs which can work at potentially helping other disorders that share some biological features, both clinically and also pathologically. These are disorders, for example, uh, DEPIC-5 causes cortical dysplasias. And when you look at the cortical dysplasias under the microscope, these cortical dysplasias have giant cells, uh, have disorganized regions of cortex that look very much like tuberous sclerosis. And indeed, these disorders, these genes, DEPIC-5, NPRL2 and 3, uh, all work on the Gator 1 complex that also downregulate mTOR activity. And so when there, when there are mutations in these genes, you essentially have too much mTOR activity. And the hope is that drugs like everolimus or sirolimus may also be helpful in these disorders. That has yet to be scientifically assessed, but the basic understanding is there that might be helpful. And then I mentioned some drugs that we stay away from with SCN1A disorders, Dravet syndrome. Uh, those are the sodium channel blockers like Lamotrigine, which occasionally is helpful, but more often is not. Phenytoin and carbamazepine and oxcarbazepine. All of those sodium channel drugs have a real potential to exacerbate epilepsy in these children and unfortunately still get used. I just had a patient admitted to a a medical center, you know, the low, low, largest one in a small state, and this child had a prolonged seizure, and they loaded the child with intravenous phenytoin, which unfortunately was the worst thing that could be done, and the child seizures were exacerbated terribly. This is literally three weeks ago in America, and the child's known to be 
have Dravet syndrome, the parents just stepped out for a bit and the doctors in the ER loaded the child. So part of this is communication. Even once we get the genetic diagnosis, educate the family, um, we still have a ways to go to make sure everyone else knows. But for Dravet syndrome, it has been an area of great research, interest, and we now have several drugs that are approved specifically for Dravet syndrome. Um, steripentol was the first one, and that's approved throughout much of Europe. It has not been approved in the U.S. yet, and it's not clear it will be because one of the effects steripentol has is it raises the clobazam metabolite, and unfortunately, all of the patients in the initial trials of steripentol for Dravet syndrome were also on clobazam. So for all of those patients, their clobazam metabolite, which is biologically active and potentially helping with seizure control and contributing to side effects, uh, those levels doubled or even were elevated more so. So the FDA currently views that as, well, we don't know that it does anything then raise clobazam or clobazam metabolite levels, so prove that it works without that and we'll approve it, and that's yet to be done. Cannabidiol is an exciting compound that I've been very involved with, uh, in the trial in Dravet syndrome, and two additional trials in lennox gastro syndrome have both been positive, and we're optimistic that the FDA may approve this drug in the near future for these disorders. Fenfluramine is another drug. This is a very old drug in some ways. It was used uh, 20 years ago or more in the United States in combination with fentramine as the fen-fen combination to treat obesity in adults. That dual therapy was complicated by cardiac valve problems and also complicated by pulmonary hypertension, leading the FDA to remove that combination from the market. Some doctors in Belgium treating children with Dravet syndrome who essentially had nowhere to go had heard that this drug had been helpful in some other epilepsies, tried it, had spectacular results, reported that, reported subsequent follow-up uh, that continued to be remarkable and more effective essentially than any, any other drug used in Dravet syndrome. And with that, a company bought the rights to test this. And the first trial in Dravet syndrome was done with what are remarkably positive results. Uh, the low dose group had a significant improvement that was statistically significant over placebo, but the higher dose group, which is still quite lower than what was used in the diet obesity patients back 20 years ago, uh, but that higher dose fenfluramine group in Dravet eight children reduced seizures 69% over placebo which is two to three-fold better than other trials in this disorder. So, you know, quite a, quite a great result, and that has, drug has received breakthrough status from the FDA and hopefully will be available commercially to patients with Dravet syndrome in the not-too-distant future. There are other ion channel disorders, for example, KCNQ2, which is one of the potassium channel genes, when it is due to a loss of function, uh, Isogabine, uh, which is a hard drug to get because it does have some side effects, but companies are working on other uh, potassium channel agents that hopefully will be more effective and safer than isogabine, but this is one potential therapy for these children who tend to have severe epilepsies. There is another set of potassium channel genes, and one of them is KCNT1. Now, when this causes a gain of function, again, letting too much potassium into the nerve cell, uh, drugs that block potassium channels may be of benefit. There was an early article in Annals of Neurology from four years ago that showed that quinidine may help children with migrating partial seizures of infancy due to KCNT1 mutations that lead to a gain of function, but a subsequent trial in adults who have severe autosomal dominant nocturnal frontal lobe epilepsy due to a mutation in this gene, it completely failed. And that was a much larger, more rigorous trial. Now, it may be children with one form of the genetic uh, disorder with migrating partial seizures do well, and those with frontal lobe epilepsy in adult life do less well. Or again, it may be the law of small numbers. That first study was a very small number of patients and those small numbers can always be dangerous. They're promising and are worth following up on, but as of now, I think uh, the jury is out with it leaning towards we need other agents in this disorder. There are several others. Another uh, potassium 1.2 channel 
blocker for aminopyridine has been suggested as a treatment for KCNA2. Again, some of these may work in cell cultures, but the translation to humans is still quite early. Memantine, which is an NMDA receptor antagonist, which has been approved to, to be an adjunct in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease, uh, has been suggested as a treatment for epilepsy due to mutations in GRIN2A or GRIN2B, which are the glutamine, uh, gluta glutamate 2NA and uh, 2NB subunits of the NMDA receptors. And then I want to just touch on, and this is one of a series of ways to approach genetic disorders uh, in patients, which is more individualized. So I think precision epilepsy is where you know a gene like SCN1A or DRAVE syndrome. We know to stay away from sodium channel blockers. We know that certain drugs like valproic acid, clobazam from clinical experience, some of the newer drugs, hopefully cannabidiol, seripentol in Europe, and fenfluramine may be effective uh, in treating these children. But then you get into another level of precision where you want to take a child's specific mutation. Because remember, some of these ion channel genes can cause a loss of function, and some mutations may lead to a gain of function. So it's good to know which of those you're having, because if you have a gain of function, you want to give a drug that dampens down that receptor, that ion channel's activity. But if it's the opposite, well, that drug could make things worse. So this is a way to look at individuals. And here's testing from a patient that I take care of. It's a young girl I saw for, have seen for many years. Uh, and this is a mutation in the SCN 8A gene. As you can see on the left side of this, this is from an O site recording by Steve Petru in Melbourne, Australia. Um, he took the wild type, and on the black left graph, you can see what happens when you change the voltage level of the cell membrane activity and what happens in the opening of that gate. Now, the opening of the sodium 8A sodium channel gate is shown where those two sets of lines intersect. And if you look to the right, this is the R1872Q, SCN 8A gene mutation that my patient has. And in this case, when that is done in the same oocyte, you can see at the very bottom there, around negative 40, there's a much wider opening that sodium channel opens at too wide a distribution of millivolts, going from negative 60 all the way to something like negative 25 or so, whereas the other one is really tight, like negative 45 to negative 35. Uh, the mutation causes a much wider opening and longer opening of that sodium channel. So this child is getting too much sodium into her nerve cells. And indeed, this child has been treated with a sodium channel blocker that has been quite effective. But what this paradigm of paranomics does, and it's done as a company charging patients um, individually, depending on how expensive the assay and testing and high throughput screen will be, but they can take a thousand drugs that are approved by the FDA for which we have safety data and test them in these single cell O sites for their effect on normalizing function. And remarkably, three different drugs that I would have never predicted could be potentially beneficial. Amitriptyline, nilabitapine, which is a calcium channel blocker, and carbidellol, which is a beta blocker, are all very, very potent at normalizing the function of these receptors. So this is, for me, a bit of a game changer in how we think about taking care of patients. It was great to know they had a disorder and that in general sodium channel blockers will work, but now we can identify other drugs that may be quite safe. These drugs are often well tolerated, have good safety profiles, are FDA approved, and can be used in patients with specific genetic disorders uh, and can be helpful for some of these patients. But there are yet other ways to move therapy forward, and I think one simple way is by the scientific, and, and here I mean all of us, from companies like Ambry, from 
geneticists, from epileptologists and pediatric neurologists, to everyone trying to pull data. And we often don't do a great job at it. One of my favorite SAID examples is the vagus nerve stimulator was approved in 1997. That's now 21 years ago. And to the best of my knowledge, there is no good scientific evidence about what stimulation parameters are best. Is it best to keep it at 0.5 milliamps or is it best to go to 3 milliamps? Is it best to stimulate 30 seconds on and five minutes off a duty cycle of under 10% or is it worth treating patients with uh, rapid cycling seven seconds on and 14 seconds off where it's a 33% on phase? The answer is there's a lot of opinion, but there's no fact and we should do better because the only way we move forward is with scientific data. For things like My Epilepsy Diary and Seizure Tracker, two of the most commonly used apps for tracking seizures, um, there's been over 1.2 million seizures tracked over eight years. There's a lot of data, uh, but part of it is collecting it systematically and thinking about it with specific hypotheses in mind. So for the genetic epilepsies, which are often rare, often spread out, among epilepsy centers, there are genes I'm interested in because of patients I take care of, like DHPS. I happen to take care of two kids in one family with it, but to date, we've only identified two or three other children in the world. Those numbers will probably rapidly grow as this gene is now added to an epilepsy panel. But again, this is these studying these patients is not something any single center or any single doctor can do. It's going to be a new era of collaboration to move forward. So what are some of the other things that are going on? And again, as many of you know, parents are leading the way. They've led the way for many disorders like cystic fibrosis, for tuberous sclerosis. And things you can do with your child's genetic disorder is to create specific lines. You can use CRISPR-Cas9 uh, and create cell lines like were done in the oocyte that I showed you before. You can take your child's own stem cells and have them differentiated into neurons. And the picture on the top right is one of pure neurons that were differentiated from a child's stem cells. Uh, and then the two figures below that are organoids, where you take thousands, tens of thousands of those differentiated nerve cells, put them in a Petri dish, and let them grow together, and they form mini brains. And those are called organoids, which are now in the early stages of scientific experimentation, but we think will be very useful ways to study how different mutations affect cellular architecture, affect network activity in electrical circuits, affect neurotransmitters, so there's much to learn. Zebrafish are an early model, which has been proven helpful in several genetic epilepsies, like SCN1A disorders where you can do relatively high throughput screens of different compounds, and people have indeed been able to verify that drugs that work in humans and in mice with Dravet syndrome, or the equivalent, uh, work in zebrafish with the uh, evolutionary homologue of SCN1A knocked out or knocked down through various genetic techniques. And then the same can be done with mice. Uh, people who have genetic disorders in their themselves or their children can take that mutation and relatively easy put into a mouse. Now, mice are not amenable to high throughput screening. You can't test 1,000 compounds. But if you've tested 1,000 compounds in a model such as the oocyte electrophysiology model or in some other models like IPSCs, looking at physiology, which you can do high throughput screening in, uh, then you could take some of those promising compounds and test them in mouse models of the disorder and study it in a mammal that is much closer evolutionarily to humans than zebrafish or cell lines. And then there are two ways to do it. There's high throughput screens and then more focused research on higher animals such as mice. And then finally, you know, there are other ways to go about treating genetic disorders. I'm currently doing a trial with adalurin, which is a read-through compound uh, that can help in cell culture for sure, and there's some nice human data as well, but can increase the production of protein that would normally not be produced because there's a premature stop codon. 
So it essentially reads over that premature stop codon, substitutes in another amino acid, and whereas normally those chains that uh, have a third of it, half of it, two thirds normal, and the rest after that premature stop codon is basically void, those proteins will be metabolized by cellular mechanisms that recognize abnormal proteins. And so individuals who have those haplo insufficiencies, they've got one normal copy and one copy with a premature stop codon, they're essentially running on 50% of the normal dose of that gene or protein. And we believe restoring that doesn't have to be to 100% can be helpful. And I'll get to that on this slide. There's also in genetics been some radical advances in what's been called CRISPR uh, Cas9.2, um, where several scientific laboratories, including David Luz at Mass General, have published major transformative papers where they can repair missense mutations very specifically, changing single letters in an entire gene that is very selective for that gene and opens the future for repairing missense mutations, frame shift mutations, and premature stop codons. There's a long way to go from treating these in a Petri dish where they do quite well now to treating them in the human body and even with more difficulty treating them in the human brain. There's the idea that we could try to upregulate promoters of good genes. For example, I discussed the issue of a haplo insufficiency of STN1A. Now, what we know is that the whole exome tells us about the proteins, but whole genome, which is now being used more and more on a research level and will hopefully yield important findings, the whole genome will tell us a tremendous amount about regulatory proteins. And if so we think of genes as the lights, the light bulbs in our ceilings when we look up, the regulatory proteins are the switches on the walls that allow you to turn the lights on and off, allow you to modulate the light intensity up or down. Uh, and so these are going to be absolutely critical things, both to identify when they're abnormal, because they will cause diseases, but they're also targets to treat diseases. So if you know a child has one normal SCN1A gene and one abnormal one, and they're running at 50%, if we could upregulate that normal one to produce 30% more protein, 50% more protein, that might take a child from having Dravet syndrome to potentially, in theory, uh, being closer to normal. And I'll give you one anecdote of a case that I was able to take care of and, and help write up in the medical literature. This was a child who some of my work in the sudden unexplained death in childhood registry uh, case came in. This child had had multiple febrile seizures, but was otherwise considered a healthy child at age 20 months, and then one day died suddenly. No explanation. Um, you know, many of these children do have febrile seizures, so it's thought probably the febrile seizures related, although this remains a bit speculative. And then this, the brother subsequently was diagnosed with Dravet syndrome. And so here we have this one child who dies, who's had multiple febrile seizures, and a brother, a sibling, who's diagnosed with Dravet syndrome. And it seems unlikely those two things are by chance. We were very lucky that the state that the child who died from keeps a blood spot card from every child who's born, and we were able to get the DNA from that card, uh, sent it for sequencing, the research lab, and they confirmed the identical mutation without knowing what that was ahead of time that the sibling with Dravet had. Now, we went back and tested both parents, and the father turns out to have a roughly 15% expression or 20% expression of that abnormal SCN1A gene. So he's a mosaic. He has 80, 85% normal SCN1A function in his blood. We don't know what's going on in his brain. But quite likely, having 80% normal makes you fully normal. This father is a bright, healthy adult, married with kids, uh, working full-time, athletic. So having 20% deficiency in this gene likely means you're normal. Although I don't know that 100% in his brain. We just know it was in his blood. 
Uh, whereas having 50% deficiency in the brain, almost certainly without a doubt, will give full-fledged severe Dravet syndrome. So again, strategies that just upregulate promoters could be an incredible approach. And then there are many other ways. Transfer RNA is being looked at to alter the duration of messenger RNA half-life, which will lead to increased protein. Uh, and then there are just many, many, many novel ways that new researchers are looking to modify genes, to deliver genes directly to the brain. Uh, AAV9 is something that's being used by multiple companies and many researchers. Uh, I'm collaborating with a researcher at MIT who's using lentivirus and adenovirus to deliver much larger payloads and has a patented polymer that makes those viruses non-immunogenic, which has been the major limitation. So again, not that any of these things are ready for prime time, but they're all in the delivery pipeline. And with that, I, I will stop and lead you with hopefully what is a promising future for new therapies and would be happy to take any questions. Morgan, can you hear me? There we go. Are we back? I'm here. I can hear you. Okay. Sorry, everybody, a little technical difficulty. So the question that we have received if there are tumors and a mutation identified in a gene within the Gator 1 complex or MTOR complex, what is the suggested counseling regarding tumors and risk of malignancy, in your opinion? So, my understanding is certainly for the mTOR pathway, there is an increased risk of malignancy, um, although it, it is relatively low. Now, two benign tumors are very common uh, in patients with tuberous sclerosis, whether on the skin, in the kidneys, in the brain, heart. Uh, so I think tumors are common. Malignant tumors are definitely at an increased frequency, but they are certainly not uh, common in those disorders. For patients with uh, gator pathway lesions, again, my knowledge, and I'm not the world's expert on this, is that those are also, in general, associated with more benign abnormalities like cortical dysplasia, uh, but not malignant tumors, although I would uh, defer to experts on that. Thank you. And uh, we'll give a few more minutes to see if any other questions come through. Okay, well, it looks like that's all the questions, but if anybody thinks of anything else, you can email educatenext at ambrygen.com. And we just, again, wanted to say thank you to Dr. Davinsky for the wonderful presentation today. And we also want to invite you to join us next week, Monday, April 23rd, for a talk on understanding polygenic risk scores, the next step in individualizing breast cancer risk assessment with Dr. Ora Gordon. Thanks everybody.